Hello and welcome to another um, multivariable calculus online class. So this um, week I want to cover um, the two big theorems of Stokes and Divergence Theorem. So pretty much we've looked in the last um, several times different ways of doing um, vector line integrals and vector uh, and flux integrals which are I guess vector surface integrals effectively. Uh, and so there are ways to do, there's different ways of doing them. Um, and so you can approach them um, directly, so by parameterization, um, which you can always get to the answer eventually, but sometimes they can be pretty hard going. And so it's nice to fall back into some of the more powerful theorems, which are all essentially generalizations of a fundamental theorem of calculus, essentially. Um, and all these theorems, including um, all these high level ones, can be generalized as one special one if you're. Um, got the right language for it all, um, which I won't quite go that far. Um, so the two I want to consider is Stokes theorem and divergence theorem. They're pretty much the, the two I want to consider. And they're really um, a bit like Green's theorem. So Green's theorem is a really useful way of solving um, vector line integrals of a closed curve um, in a 2D region. And so these are sort of ideas that generalize to high dimensions in different regards, I guess is the simple way of putting it. Um, so the first one is Stokes theorem, which is just a direct translation. It pretty much is the same as Green's theorem. So it's still a, it's it really applies to vector line integrals around a closed curve, but this curve now doesn't have to sit in 2D, you can sit in 3D. That's pretty much the only difference. Um, and so whenever you've got a vector line integral or a closed curve, um, you can always use Stokes theorem. If it happens to be in 2D, you might as well just use Green's because it's a few less calculations on the piece of paper, but it ends up being exactly the same very quickly. So um, how it works, um, you can use it two different directions. I guess the intention is more go from left to right as written, um, but I'll show you can do it both ways. And that is um, the the closed into around a closed curve of a, a vector line integral is the double integral of the curl of that um, through the surface which is which has a bounding, which has a boundary of that particular surface. So that's the basic idea. So let's just do one example, and we'll see what this corresponds to. And again, fire questions as you got them as you as you want. Okay. So let's just try to draw what we've got here. So in 3D, um, we have a triangle. Um, so we've got our standard axis X, Y, Z, and it's a right-handed set. Um, and so we've got um, at 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1. So we've got, make it up there. So we've got three points sitting in 3D space, um, and which form a, a triangle. And basically, looking from above, um, we're going to transverse it anti-clockwise. And so this is our um, surface, or curve, actually just a curve, really. So the outside of the triangle is just the curve. Um, and what we want to do is we want to do a, a vector line integral around this particular curve. So in terms of physics, um, um, if you've got this particular um, vector, if this particular, say, force field, this would be the total work going around that particular curve. That's one in terms of forces. In terms of fluid flow, so that's the direction, the how to flow. A, of how the, the fluid flows, so at any particular instance, then this is the total amount of circulation around that curve, is the fancy way of saying it. So just how much the, the whole field rotates as you go around this field. And you can certainly do it directly. So it's three different curves, it's three different straight lines. You can parameterize each straight line and then just do it by integration by substitution effectively along each particular line, that's the, the basic way. Um, which is not which is only doable, just takes a while you have to do three things. So the alternative way of doing it is to use Stokes theorem, 
And so if we call this f, this would be going to be equal to the double integral of the curl of f um, dot ds for some particular surface. Now you might as well make the surface as easy as you want, of course. And you go, well, um, I might as well make the surface to be this bit of the triangle in the plane. Like I'd make it curved if I really wanted to, but as you can see, there's very little point for doing that. So I'm going to get my surface um, T, for example, to be in closed triangle. And so I'm going to integrate over my enclosed triangle and my surface of this particular thing. So in order to be able to answer the question, um, I need to know what the curl of F is. So the curl of F, as I said um, last week, um, is just a matter of rotation there in the body. And you work that out um, by taking the cross product of Nabla, which is just a bunch of da the different partial derivative operators in order with the original um, vector field. So y squared, z squared, x squared. And, uh, you know, it's not really a determinant. It's just a convenient way of writing it down. It's probably more truthful. Um, but because of this rule, lots of the results you might know about time and cross products or may not know immediately um, can be helpful, help be used here. So uh, the first component of the curl um, is going to be the partial derivative of y um, given of fx squared, which is nothing, and then you go out the other way, a minus the partial derivative of z squared with respect to z, which gives you minus 2z. The next component, um, you alternate signs, so a big minus sign, and then you do partial derivative of x. x squared gives you 2x, and then you do minus partial derivative of y squared with respect to z, which gives you nothing. And so you're left with just minus 2x. And in a similar way, taking a, this sort of um, product, so partial derivative of x of z squared gives you nothing, minus partial derivative of y squared with respect to y gives you 2y. So that's the curl in this case. So stop me if you need questions. And so that's what we going to plug into here. Now in order to work out any vector, um, so any flux integral as this one is here, we would like to know how much the, the basically the curl here flows through this surface. That's sort of what the idea is. And so we just need to work out the normal. Now because I've chosen the surface nicely, I can easily work out what the normal is. And because the normal is going to be pointing up. So it's going to be pointing up, and so the normal, um, being a unit, is just going to be pointing in the k direction. Now, a question I've got is, how do you know it's not pointing down? So um, how do you know the normal's not pointing down? Well, why is it pointing up? Do you have any idea? Because uh, that's an important sort of thing you have to think through. There are two choices for normal at any point. How do you work out which one's which, essentially? Um, and yes, sorry, so it's in the positive direction. And the, the way you work it out is really about orientation. So you have to make sure the orientations match up, which is what you had suggesting. So the original curve's anti-clockwise. And so how you do it to work out the direction, you get your right-hand thumb, so, and you curl your fingers in the direction of the curve, which this means you stick your hand right up right up and you curl your fingers in the anti-clockwise direction and then your thumb then points in the direction of the normal. So in this case points up. So by following the curve lines with your right hand you can then work out the direction of the normal from that. And that, that gives the matching orientation um, to the surface and the outside curve. So it's by right hand rule. So they both have, as you say, positive orientation. There we go. And so, essentially, any flux integral, this one here, really is just code for get the vector field, take the component of that in the direction of the normal, and then add it up over the whole surface. So this d tilde s is the 
um, is a vector line equal and ds is just adding up over a bit of the surface area of the surface, that's the idea. Um, and so in this case, uh, what we really need to do then is the component of my curl in the direction of the normal. But if you think about it, in here, is just 0, 0, 1. So we're just taking the dot product of these two particular vectors. And the dot product of these two vectors, most of it cancels out and you're left with just minus 2y. And so our integral then, by Stokes' theorem, is now the double integral of my triangle of minus 2y um, times by a bit of area. And since it's a nice flat area, um, I often just write da um, to organise a normal area, but it ds in, ds in more general terms. So that's what we're going to try to work out. So just pretty much the area of it, so just integrating over a triangle of minus 2y. Now there's a few ways of doing that. Um, I'll do it the quick way first and then I'll um, indicate the slow way without doing all the calculations. Um, so I can factorise um, the minus 2 out, of course, um, yda. But any integrals with just integrating y, would, if you get it right, would give you the y coordinate of the centre of mass. As a matter of fact, if it's 1 over the mass, that would give you the y coordinate centre of mass. So I just got to get that term in, I've got to put mass in there, make it balance out. So this is going to be equal to minus 2 times by the mass times by the y coordinate of the centre of mass. And because it's a triangle, because we know the whole thing is a triangle, it's easy to work some of these things out. So the mass of the triangle is just the area of it um, in general. And so the area of that triangle, it's got length of 1, height of 1. So therefore, a half times 1 times 1 gives you half, is the area. And the y coordinate of the centre of mass is just the average value for all the y's. So if you look at the original points, so these are the y values. So you take the average of those, add them up, you get 1, um, divide by 3, so 3 of them gives you a third. And so if you do this product, you get the answer of minus a third. So that's the quick way of doing it. Um, and I haven't actually done really much in integration at all, really. Um, so the slow way is you now have got um, the integral of da is just to parameterize the triangle. So if you look, draw the shadow of it all. That's the easiest way of doing it. So we're integrating over this sort of shadow. Then we're going to integrate um, then dy dx. And the top curve is y equals so 1 minus x. The bottom curve is y equals 0. And so we're integrating y from 0 to 1 minus x, as you can see from our shadow. And x is from 0 to 1, again, we can see from the shadow. And then you just do the integral as per, as per normal as we've done earlier. Just a, a few other tips about these things in general um, is that when you when you decompose these sort of um, integrals, sometimes you might get z's cropping up in here. And you can see that we integrating respect to x and y is when to get rid of z's. And the way to get rid of that is to use the surface. So we actually know that this particular triangle, as I've drawn it, all sits in a plane z equals 1. That's, I chose it for that particular reason to make it nice. And therefore, if there was any z's cropping up, I'd just make them into 1's, and that gets rid of them for me. Um, so that's sort of how I do it. So as you, a few other tips here. Um, whenever you're trying to do integrate surfaces like this, looking at the shadow they project on the xy plane or some other plane, it's often a really useful way of working out key parameters if you ever need it, like I've got here. So this is the shadow. So this thing is the sort of shadow of the whole surface. So that gives you the answer. So um, I encourage you to use tricks where you can, like this sort of mass, but you don't have to. And this integral here, it's only doable, fortunately. So that's the that's the idea of Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem, as I said before, just summarising, is just a way of handling um, 
vector line integrals around closed curves in 3D. That's where its real strength is. And this is using it sort of directly as intended, I guess is one way of putting it. Um, you can, though, use it in other sorts of ways. And that is you can use it to help work out um, curl um, integrals of involving curl directly, because again, that sort of crops up. So let's have a look at the sort of picture we've got here. So we've got our x, y axes again, and testing my drawing ability tremendously here. Um, so we've got our a hemisphere. This is our hemisphere. So this is a sort of surface up here um, with standard orientation, which means the normal's pointing outwards. Um, so what I want to do is I'm considering, uh, what I want to know is I want to consider the total um, flux of the curl across this particular surface. Now this surface is annoying because it's curved, which means you're going to have to parameter, if you want to try to work out the curl directly, um, you're going to have to work out the unit, the normal, which actually is not too bad because it's a sphere at least, um, and then go from that. So because it's the vector noodle of curl, we can actually use Stokes' theorem to get rid of the whole curve nature entirely. So if I just get a red line here, so the boundary of this hemisphere here is just this circle. Um, we'll call it C. And C here is just going to be the curve. It's going to be just um, a bunch of X, Y's and well, Z, 0. And it's pretty much where the hemisphere meets the X, Y axis. So it's going to be when X squared plus Y squared equals 1. So it's a nice circle. And so by Stokes' theorem, this summing up of the curl um, is just the integral around just the boundary here of this curve I've made up, the circle, which is f dot dr. And that gets rid of the whole curve nature. And I could work that out. So I've got f here. Um, um, I can then proceed that way, and because it's you know, X, well, on a circle, you could do effectively some sort of poly, uh, something like polar coordinates to then simplify, uh, and that would work nicely. The other thing is though, whenever you've got a closed integral of a, a closed curve, so a vector integral around a closed curve, you can always use Stokes' theorem. So what I can do is I can use Stokes' theorem a second time, and that is I can use Stokes, but instead of producing that horrible hemisphere at the top. I can pick another surface, which is a bit easier. So an easier surface would be this disk here, for example. So just mentioning my precision language that I use, I, re I refer to circle as being just a curve and a disk as being a, the solid um, filled in part, essentially. So that's my distinction. So disks are two dimensional, curves are one dimensional in my mind. But anyway, this disk, is pretty much um, z equals 0 and x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. So that's the, that's the height, the shaded in disk. And so by using Stokes a second time, so again, Stokes a second time, this would be the double integral across not the hemisphere but now just this disk which is a bit easier because it's the normal's easy to predict etc of the curl of f dot ds so i'm using stokes theorem twice effectively not necessary but that's the way i'm going to pr proceed um, so then you have to work some things out so in order to actually answer the question we have to work out the curl of f is So again, you do I, J, K, write down the differential operators, um, write down the vector field, so minus Y, X, 0, 
and then just work things out as you go through it gradually. So the first component would be partial derivative with respect to y of 0, which is nothing, partial derivative of z with respect to z of x, which is again nothing. Next component, um, similarly you're just going to get everything's cancelling out. So it's only really the last component where you get some interesting things happening. In this case, you get the partial derivative with respect to x of x, which is 1, minus, and the partial derivative with respect to y of minus y gives you minus 1. So it's 0, 0, 2, essentially. And then you have to work out the normal. And I'm going to, the, this is the normal of the disk. And because it's in the, because it's just in the XY plane, the normal now is just going to be sticking right up here. And that's just going to be, um, because we've chosen the right orientation, just the unit, um, just K, which is 0, 0, 1. And therefore, the integral of a curl of f dot ds across this disk is just going to be the dot product of these two, really. It's the dot product of the curl and the unit normal, which is just saying the, pro the projection of the curl of f in the direction of the normal, adding up over the bits of area, bits of surface area. And the dot product of this is just going to be 2, which you're going to factorise out. So now what I've got is I'm just integrating um, 2 over the whole surface area. And since it's just integral of 1, that's just going to be the surface area of my disk. Now because the disk is a nice circle, I know areas of circle well, well, used to at least, and the area of a circle is going to be pi the radius squared, um, and since the radius is 1, it's 1 squared, and therefore the answer is 2 pi. So that's not by far, I mean, there's many ways of doing this question, um, and again, that's the challenge that um, you'll face, but I'm, what I encourage people to do when faced with these sorts of questions is to try the high level theorems because they often um, make the detail get rid of makes you avoid some of the details which therefore makes it quicker to do doesn't always work as you can imagine but uh, um, I think I would definitely that's my encouragement for it um, choosing the right coordinates normally is the biggest benefit um, and so with this one here, if you actually have to do an integration properly, which I haven't done, J using polar coordinates would be really important. Um, that's the most important time saver for it all. So again, just emphasizing, Stokes is basically a way of going back and forwards between integrals of these types. Um, and you can use it twice, as you can see here, to basically convert a surface integral over a complicated surface into one much easier to do, um, which can be a time saver for you. Um, and so it's a trade-off, um, but usually I find double integrals of nice surfaces at least easier to do than the um, of vector line integrals. That's my personal bias, I guess. You've got to make your own mind what you find easier, and so you might have just found that one and just gone with it, essentially. Um, but nevertheless, when you see an integral of that form, it really should remind you, oh, that's Stokes' theorem. And if that's written down, you go, well, I should at least consider it and see if that makes it easier. So any double integrals of the curl really come to bring to mind Stokes' theorem. So that's two applications for it. Um, in these notes here, which um, I'll go through if people really want later, but um, there are the commands how you can do the whole thing in, in Maple, um, which get a little complicated after a while, but you know, it sort of shows you how Maple might do various things. So happy to explain if you want. But um, before I do that, though, I want to just talk about the next big theorem. So the next big theorem is the divergence theorem. Um, so the divergence theorem is um, 
sort of a general again a generalization of green stem it isn't really clear how that is at first glance um, but it is it's sort of moving this whole idea into three to um, into a triple integral rather than double integral um, so pretty much what it says if you've got a closed region so if you've got a, a sort of closed region so delta b is what we call a closed region then the total flux of a vector field through that closed region is pretty much summing up the divergence across that whole region so pretty much in terms of thinking what it means the divergence which is a single scalar talks about how much the vector field um, generates or removes stuff at any single point in time so if the divergence is positive that means it's sort of creating fluid if you want to think of that way so it's a, a source is the word for it if it's a negative it's sink it means it's losing stuff so if to work out the total flux through a, a big region you're pretty much just adding up how many sources there are and taking away all the sinks and so if there's some sources and sinks will balance out they'll cancel out and looking at the net much stuff is gained slash lost from it all that's pretty much what the whole theorem is trying to say so the total flux through a region is summing up the total sources and sinks through the entire region itself um, and so in the notes um, I've shown how this is a um, direct generalization of the of Green's theorem so Green's theorem really is if you reformulate it a two-dimensional divergence theorem well this is the three-dimensional divergence theorem it's the connection between it all um, um, if you're curious you can have a look uh, we don't we don't ha don't need to know that how to use it though so let's just try to utilize it okay so um, we've got a, a vector field um, and we've got a cylinder so let's just draw my, draw my cylinder uh, so I've got a closed cylinder Moshe right there we're closed here so I've got a um, sort of closed cylinder the um, height of it is one and the um, radius of it's two so this is my cylinder here and pretty much what I want to do is I want to work out the total flux going out of this particular surface so that so if I draw um, normals at various points in time, so these are the various normals. So I'm just trying to work out the total flux going flowing out of that particular surface. Um, and given for my vector field over here, that's what I'm trying to do. So if you didn't know about these high level theorems, how you would have to approach that, you did have to work out the flux through each particular side. So you'd have to work out the flux through the top, flux through the bottom, and flux out through the curved side as well. And you have to do them all. Um, the top and bottom being in the planes um, aren't too bad, but trying to do it around the curve gets annoying. Um, and so it really, really benefit from trying to use a high level theorem to try to um, make things simplified for you. And any flux through a closed region, um, you can use divergence theorem. And the divergence theorem pretty much is we're just adding up over the entire solid um, so we'll call it E for a solid region um, of the divergence of F um, adding up across the whole off the whole solid so E here is the solid cylinder and that makes it much easier so in general when does divergence theorem going to work well like you can see here whenever you're trying to work out the total flux through a closed surface so closed surface means one without boundary so whenever you're trying to work out the one through a closed surface the divergence theorem applies that's pretty much what it is um, orientation's got to match out so uh, we're going to make it should be more precise um, the normals always have you pointing outwards for it to work properly 
So they're always putting inwards, you get a minus sign. So it's outward facing normals. Um, is the one other condition that I should uh, mention. So applying in this particular case, um, we work at the divergence. So the divergence, again, just a memory device, you take the dot product of Nambla and F. So Nambla is the um, vector of pass derivative operators. And we just can apply that to our vector field. X cubed, Y cubed, three. So that pretty much means to take the partial derivative of the first term respect to X plus the partial derivative of the second term respect to Y plus the next term respect to Z, um, etc. And you can do it for any number of things. And in this case, you know, I'm getting three um, X squared plus three Y squared. So that's a lot of divergence in this particular case. So what we're left with then is that our um, total flux then by the divergence theorem is going to be the triple integral over this entire solid of 3 x squared y squared um, dv. Now unfortunately I can't use tricks, I can't use um, Center, I can't use center of mass, I can't use just um, volume directly at this point in time. Um, I could use a moment of inertia, you happen to know lots of moment inertias, and that sort of that sort of integral applies in that case, um, but that's pretty unusual to know that much <laughs> um, moment of inertia, so we're just going to have to really approach it directly. Um, and you think, well, it's still based on a cylinder, um, and so I guess the first instances I would do is I'll integrate um, Z's first. So Z goes from 0 to 1, um, and then I'll integrate over the base after that. And I'll worry about that when I get to it. But at least the Z's are easy things to do. So I'm integrating um, Z first, and then I'll integrate um, the x, y's later. So I'm just, I am deferring it, but you can see why I do that in a second. So in, as always with any integral, like a triple integral I've got here, you need to integrate the inside bit first. So you inside the, integrate the inside bit, there's no z's present, um, which makes it easy, so it'll just be that times by z, plug in the limits, and you'll end up getting 3 x squared plus y squared dA. So it simplifies nicely. I skipped a step, um, so bug me if you don't like that, but um, at least it's not a big one. So now you've got face, now I've just reduced it down to a double integral, and I've just deferred it. Now I just have to think about what the base looks like. So this is where it's worthwhile drawing another picture. So what does the base of this actually look like? Well, it's going to be a circle. And it's a circle of radius 2, well, I should be more precise, it's really a disk, even, a radius 2. That's really what my base is looking like. And when I can see that the base is a bit of a circle, that suggests to me, at this point in time, I should now be using polar coordinates. Now, you maybe could have seen that in the first instance, because it's a whole base and cylinder thing. Um, but you go, as soon as you see the base, um, you go, okay, great, I can use... Polar coordinates. That's what I'm doing. So my usual rule of thumb is when you're trying to do any integrals, you really got to draw the sh for any triple anything in 3D. Even if even if the whole volume is really difficult to draw, at least try to draw the base slash shadow. In this case, the base is if it's literally sitting as well plane. Shadow if it's above it the projection down the xy plane, that really is important to try to work out how to do the integral, like I've done here. And if, and if you recognise, oh, circle, bang, that suggests polar coordinates. So polar coordinates then, um, the x squared plus y squared would then be um, r squared, da would be r dr da. Um, that was... 
let's say that again, RDA, RDRD theta for polar coordinates, and we just have to work out the limits. So, um, maybe get to thinking, what are the limits for R in this particular case? So what's the bottom and top limit? Yep, 0 to 2. And the limits for theta? Yep, so it's a whole circle. So 0 to 2 pi is fine. Um, you could also do not, it makes no difference in this case. If there was, um, if you want to use odd and even functions, you can make it minus pi to pi. Sometimes helps. In this case, no benefit. Um, because um, this, because this is sep you can separate it, because there's, the limits have no, um, the limits here don't involve each other, so you can sort of fully separate this double integral out. There's the integral of 0 to 2 pi d theta times by the integral of 0 to, to 2 of 3 r cubed dr. So the first integral um, quickly would just reduce to 2 pi. That's, so the integral of, a, of 1 d theta is just the length the integral, which would be 2 pi. And the second one, um, let's do it slower. So bump the power up by 1, divide by the new power, and then plug the limits in. So sub in 2, you're going to get 2 to the power of 4, which is um, 16. Sub in 0, you get nothing. Um, so going to give you 12, so 24 pi, I think, in the end, is our final answer. And that's much easier to do it that way than trying to approach the flux of through each component separately. Much, much easier, um, particularly because some parts are, are quite difficult to do. Yeah, that's right. So uh, as you've been going through tutorial 9, there have been some boxes, may not call it as hard as a cylinder, where you've been trying to work a flux throughout through the box. Um, you realise that using divergence theorem for some of those makes a much light work of it. So I certainly encourage you to, yep. Um, so I certainly encourage you to, to use divergence theorem when you can. So by the time you get to um, your online assignment 4 in particular, and your final exam. Um, both of them, um, those high level themes be come into handy. Just want to show you one more circumstance. Um, um, of where you can use divergence theorem where it doesn't actually block or applies at first glance. Um, okay, so what I really want to do is I want to find a flux integral through a paraboloid. So let's just draw my picture. So we've got to remember what paraboloids look like. We did the majors ago in this subject. So we've got a paraboloid z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared. So a paraboloid is a um, hill or a, a, a ditch, not a ditch, um, really a hole or a mountain. Um, because it's minus y squared, it's going to be a, a hill. So a paraboloid sort of parabola cross section cross sections and this one happens to have circular base that's my paraboloid um, I can work a few things out so it's got a height of nine and a radius of three around the circular base so that's my paraboloid and it's just the top by the way um, which makes it hard to draw so that's the paraboloid um, just to show you they've got something different here um, let's give the name for this bottom piece here, I'll call that D for the disk, just to give a name for it. And so this paraboloid is one surface, and this disk down here is another one. So we've got two different surfaces. Um, and there, so the paraboloid's not closed, that's the key thing. So put some normals in, um, let's make the paraboloid orientated up, and the disk orientated down, so these are my normals just to keep the same thing. So what I'd like to do ultimately is work out the flux through this paraboloid at the top, knowing the orientation. Now you can work that out um, directly, so you could parameterize it um, uh, 
so parameterize it in terms of well, Cartesian coordinates or um, polar coordinates, um, either or, polar coordinates are ultimately what you need to do, and work it out that way. Now, you can't use divergence theorem directly to work it out. So if you try to use divergence theorem, you're not, it's going to fail because divergence theorem really requires a closed a surface for it to work. And it's not closed. It's got a big hole in the bottom of it. But you can use divergence theorem as a little trickery. And that is to say that uh, if you combine the two together, so if you did the total flux, not just through the proboloid, but also through the bottom as well, so the bottom disc and the proboloid together, then it would be a closed surface. And being a closed surface, then you could use divergence theorem. So, so long as um, this resulting integral here is not too bad, this could be a, a, a time saver. So let's just think about it. So doing both together would be the triple integral of the enclosed solid. It's called E for the bit inside. So E is the bit inside of the divergence of F summing over the whole volume. And let's just do an aside what the divergence of F actually is. So the divergence of F um, is just the partial derivative with respect to X of the first thing, plus the partial derivative with respect to Y of the next one, um, plus the partial derivative with respect to Z of the next item, etc. Um, so you're getting things, you're getting 2Y minus 2Y plus 0 gives you 0. So the divergence in this, in this particular case is 0, which is really nice. And so if you add it up zero everywhere, you're going to get zero. So because there was no, because there's zero divergence across the whole place, this integral becomes really simple. That still hasn't answered our question yet, but um, we're getting there. So basically, if you do the double, the flux across the enclosed region, we're going to get zero. But the double integral of um, the joined up region is going to be just the summing up of the two individual pieces. So it's going to be integral of the paraboloid, which is what I really want, um, plus the integral down through the disk. So it's the two pieces together. So this is what we want, that's the goal. So if you can just work out this one over here, then we can do it. Now, we've still to do some work, I mean, uh, unfortunately, but doing the flux integral through this disk is easier because I can work at unit normal much easier. Um, I don't have to um, put my, nearly as much effort in that case. And therefore, it's a, certainly going to be an easier problem to do. So they are double integral through the paraboloid then. is going to be minus of the integral down through the disk um, and F here is where it was before um, 2xy minus y squared um, minus 1 and we're taking dot product with the unit normal. And I can see from the picture, as I've drawn here, the unit normal is just going to be pointing down. And because it's not nice plane, it's going to be parallel to the one accord axis, so it's just going to be k. So in this case, the unit normal is dot product of 0, 0, 1. And I want to integrate that over the entire surface area, and because it's a disk, I'm like DA, which is just to the screen, sorry. So taking the dot product, um, you're just left with um, well, minus 1 DA, the minus signs cancel out, so just the integral of across the whole surface area, and that's just going to be therefore be equal to the area of the disk, and the disk is a circle, and so it's going to be pi the radius squared. So 9 pi in this case. Um, so if I haven't made a mistake, we can see that the 
air the the flux through the paraboloid is equal to nine pi. Um, which in that case was an easy thing. Now why it was why this particular problem was nice is mostly because of the divergence clapped down to something really simple. That's what really uh, that's what really made it easier. If the divergence didn't collapse down to zero, then that approach might not work very well. Um, so that same approach um, I mentioned in the solutions for assignment. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get. No, no. So um, I'm getting my assignments confused. So you can do the same trick. I was about to say my solutions for assignment three, but I probably shouldn't tell you that yet because you haven't necessarily submitted it. Um, so in for um, vector line integrals, um, you can do the same tricks. Whereas if you've got a conservative um, function, i.e., where the um, you know, so we got if it's over in two D and you're a conservative function, then you can pretty much um, choose any path you want to at all. It's the same idea here. So when the divergence is equal to zero, you can really move the f move the um, the surface around a lot um, to try to work things out. Um, is a sort of idea, and you can uh, again, if it's not conservative, you can basically close off a curve and use Green's theorem in two D. That's the same idea of what I'm doing here. So I've just um, Closing off the curve and using an advanced theorem to try to work it out, and so long as the bit in between isn't too bad to work out, it can help. It can sometimes make it much harder, though. So again, um, one of the morals of the story in this subject in particular is you'll see that there's more and more ways of doing things, which I'm sure you're aware of already, but you have to think carefully about which way because some of them um, provide real headaches, while the others just make it uh, make it a dream of it. And so you have to think what's going to really work here. And again, you can make a choice, and then if it gets hard, you can maybe I should try the other way. Um, so in your exam, which I guess is what you're thinking about, um, and your online assignment four, which has both, so that's where you're going to assess on this stuff I'm looking at today for both of them. Um, I've tried to give you some hints in them about what method that I would encourage you to do. Um, I've designed them so that um, if you don't choose the method I'm trying to shadow you into, um, you still should be able to get it without too much effort. Um, that's the hope. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to do an integral um, through a box, most of the, the integrals through most of the sides sort of um, fall to zero, perhaps, and you can use divergence. And that, that sort of um, idea is what I try to go for. Uh, you know, you can't do so much when you're coming up with some examples sometimes, but um, so I certainly try to shadow questions, so um, you know lead you in one direction just to not make it too bad. It's only for this latter stuff, um, whereas with maybe the double integrals, I'll leave less assistance for you to think through. Um, but as you can see, with both these theorems mentioned today, we really require closed things. So for Stokes theorem, you require a closed curve, and allows you to align. A vector line or a closed curve you can simplify and the divergence theorem is if you've got a closed surface then you can simplify it to a, an integral one of one higher order. So that's the, the similar sort of theme for both of them. So that's the um, major thing I want to uh, sort of cover today. So that finishes off um, the content um, for this subject. So the next few weeks I'll, I'll look at some revision. Um, the so in terms of what to now, um, you need to make sure you submit your third assignment. Um, then uh, you can look at the um, online assignment four. So essentially what they really are is it's one big assignment just split up into two bits essentially. And the online assignment four is just that um, covers just what I've covered today. And that is the Stokes and Divergence Theorem essentially. Um, or, flux, or flux integrals in more general terms. So um, I'd encourage you to use these particular theorems if you can. Stokes Divergence for online assignment four, and it's just done in an uh, online way. So I did that just so that I could have it due very late in the session, but still get your results to you in a way that you can you know, perhaps utilise. So um, I will, as soon as 
the deadline finishes for that, for Sonline or Summit 4, um, I'll release the uh, feedback and marks, etc., um, which then gives you about a week and a half to um, prepare for your exam. So just um, some questions on Sonline or Summit 4, um, which is worthwhile mentioning, is um, if you haven't looked at it yet, it's, it's an assignment, it really is an assignment. So that means, like any other assignment, you can look at the questions and should look at the questions well before the due time. So you go and look at the questions. Um, there's no time limit as such, so it's not a quiz. There's no time limit. So just go along, look at the questions. So there's only two of them, um, and then you you might want to print it out or you have it on the screen in front of you. And yes, you have to do some calculations on the piece of paper, which could takes a little while. And depends you're up to. Once you're ready, you can then go back and type the answer in, and the answer is just a numerical answer for both of them. So just some sort of number. Um, for they're both just like today. We've got lots of answers. So type the answers in. And you have to do it in one else place thing. So it, it does tell you in the question. Um, then when you type it in, as soon as you type it in, the system saves it. But you can hit save if you're a bit paranoid. Um, and you can do them separately, you don't have to answer at the same time. Once you think you're ready, both your questions are ready, um, you hit submit. As soon as you hit submit, it basically sends the solutions in, and that's it. You can't do anything more for it. Um, so make sure you really are ready before you, when you hit submit. Um, I can, there's always help. So if you do it too early or whatever it might, might be, I um, could just unlock it for you in some regard. Um, that's okay. Um, well, there's some randomization of questions, so you know sometimes it's a little bit more annoying. But I can always give you a second go if you really just um, stuff things up. I'm, I don't really want to penalise people just for um, silly things. Um, but if you avoid them, it makes it your life easier, of course. So try. Um, what else was I going to say about the online assignment? Um, yeah, so. If you do, please submit by the due date as well. So if you don't submit by the due date, I'll just submit whatever you got there um, for you. But it slows it down, so it's quicker if you do it yourself um, as well. It's my other encouragement to say. Um, but yeah, to have a look, um, you might want to finish assignment three first, of course. Um, and also in preparation for your exam, you need. I'd encourage you to try the question, the optional questions of, of um, assignment three. What I mean by optional is um, I don't expect you to do them at all as part of the submission, but I expect, I'd encourage you to do them for practice. Um, you don't see the solutions, so they're good practice and revision for the final exam. Um, I'll give solutions to those questions when I give the solutions to the rest of assignment three, um, which I hope to do at, at most um, by the end of session. Um, Sorry, um, early if I can. So I, as long as people haven't got extensions, etc., um, I'll do it earlier. But you know, by the end of session, at the last moment. So that's a civic overview of um, the technicality. So what I want to do next week is I'll talk about um, revision, what the exam looks like, etc. So I'll do more of that. But just want to cover assignment. So um, just before we finish off, um, do you have any questions today um, that you'd like me to? Yep. Far away. Yep. No, so Stokes' theorem is used, um, um, really, it's designed for vector line integrals. That's what it's really for. So if I scroll back, um, It's really used for that. It's really going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So it's basically a way of doing a vector line integral, so a curve integral, and it's converting it into a flux across the surface. And you, and you pick the, the surface um, rather than the other way. I mean, you can, I've shown an example for both directions, but it's more that way. That's more what it's intended for. That's the first point. So good question. Yeah, when you have a 3D object, do 
we're taking it for granted it's closed. Um, look, uh, I, um, I, in questions, I really try to be careful when it's saying it's closed. So um, certain objects like a sphere automatically are. Um, um, and you can say a rectangular prism, again, normally is automatically closed. When I've said cylinder here, um, it is a bit ambiguous, so I should have um, said that more clearly in the question. And um, sometimes a little, I'm a bit quick when I write down my notes here, as you can see, but in assessment, I try to be more precise. Um, but, so normally it should say, unless the object is inherently closed like a sphere in the first place. Um, so a paraboloid is in, inherently open, essentially, um, in that last question. <coughs> okay, that's easy. Um, so um, have a go, practice those questions. So go through the questions in tutorial 10 um, to get on top of it. Um, you can finish off assignment three first, of course, that, that might be more your everyone's priority. Um, but I've now got two weeks for revision. So um, please think through questions that you guys have got um, so across the whole subject, even if you can't attend live. So I know lots of people watch these recordings. So if you watch recordings, please just um, flick send them an email or put a message on the forum about some sort of content you want to cover. You're going, you know what, I really am still a bit hazy about um, quadric surfaces, can you do some revision on that, or whatever it might be, and please think about it and send stuff to me um, next week, and I'll make sure I cover it in this sort of meeting. But thanks very much for coming today, and thanks for listening, even if you are on the recording, that's good, and I'll see you um, next week.